Okay, this video is about when you want to build a kaleidoscope. How big does everything have to be, or how small, or what measurement? Well, this is all determined really by the lens that you use, and we'll talk about the focal length of a lens in another video, because I want to I want to pick that apart a little more. But this is a kind of a crudely drawn diagram I did years ago, and in the diagram, this is the lens right here. And the lens you'll be using is plano convex or, um, what's the other one? There's a double convex, I guess it's called double. DCX or PCX is what they, the way they usually um, abbreviate those. And as this shows, the one side curves out, so it's convex, and then the other side is flat. So this is plano convex, that's plano and that's convex. These are the kind of lenses that bring the rays of light that come in to a point close by. And there's another kind of lens that's um, concave, and that means it's thinner in the middle and thicker at the edges. And if you've ever been nearsighted, your eyeglass lenses are a meniscus version of that kind of lens. They're a negative lens. These are called positive lenses and uh, this is what we usually use for reading glasses and that sort of thing as well. There are, there are many combinations of lenses out there to me create things like camera lenses, binoculars, etc. So whatever your lens is that you're using, go by the focal length and then we'll have something called depth of field. Um, depth of field is um, the range at which when you look through the lens you'll see things in focus. And there's a lot of different things that determine this, most of which I don't understand. Part of it is aperture size, that is the diameter of the lens. So a smaller lens usually will have, in relation to its magnification, will have a uh, deeper depth of field. And what we mean by depth of field is, for instance, this lens, we're right up here next to the uh, the mirrors. This is what that represents there. Um, how far from the edge of the mirror would I be able to see things when I look through it in focus? Okay, so this is um, a pretty good diagram of showing what a kaleidoscope looks like exploded apart. So the mirrors would be placed inside here, the lens would be right there. In this particular case, I had to use a spacer for that specific lens um, because I originally used a thicker lens and yada, yada, yada. Anyway, so what we had was a 25 millimeter focal length lens. In short, what I had to do is make the objects be 25 millimeters from this flat side of the lens because that's where the focal length is measured from. Well, I think in some lenses it's, it's measured in the center, but anyway, in this case, we'll just say that it's a very tiny amount anyway, in this particular case. So what you have to take into account is the length of the mirrors themselves. And then um, here I have a bearing that I've used. It's a Teflon bearing between the glass that separates the objects and the object chamber. That's what these are supposed to be, little pieces of colored glass that I've flame worked or whatever. And so you need to have the distance where you think these objects will be lying in this chamber to be within that depth of field for this 25 millimeter lens. Um, you can't just go by what you see as a depth of field because everybody's vision is different. And there's something called eye relief, which they use on microscopes and um, oh, telescopes and all sorts of things, binoculars, and and, it, and it's the distance that a person can focus naturally, uh, for instance, to read. Um, on eye relief, that can be in normal eyes, anywhere from about eight inches to 12. And um, most people are in that range. Uh, my vision used to be so nearsighted before I had eye surgery that I could focus on something just an inch from my eye. I had almost microscopic vision at the time, but unfortunately without glasses, I could see almost nothing, even across the room. Uh, so that's the story on that, that's another time. Anyway, so what we have to do is consider this distance, 
to this distance, this mirror has to be shorter than 25 millimeters to accommodate the thickness of this bearing, the thickness of this glass, and then the objects. So let's say you're looking through this kaleidoscope and you tilt your head back. These objects will hit right up against the glass. And what I figured those out to be, if I did this right in 1999, uh, would be about 25 millimeters to the centers of those objects, which were less than a millimeter uh, deep. So I believe at the time that had a depth of field of like two and a half millimeters. I'm just going by memory here. But all you have to do is figure that into the, the range of your lens that you're using. Now, as far as width of the mirrors and length of the mirrors, I like to use sort of a formula. Um, it's a ratio. So if your mirror lens or your mirror was one inch wide, you would probably want a mirror that is between say, five inches long and eight inches long, right in there. And those lengths are extremes that give different effects. The shorter the, the mirror is in relation to the width, the more you feel like you're up in the image, like the image is like right on top of you. And just depends on the person, it's mostly taste, but it can give kind of almost a claustrophobic effect sometimes if you do that one where it's up close. Then at the other extreme, it's like, the image of the that the kaleidoscope uh, image that we're accustomed to, like the pie shape or the three mirror image, which is the dodecahedron or whatever, the 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 dome, is going to be like at a distance or down a tunnel. Um, you'll get the tunnel effect more with a two a uh, two mirror configuration than you will with a three mirror. My favorite right now is the thirty sixty ninety configuration, which is mirrors that are configured in a triangle, um, and each edge of the triangle is described in that name, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, and 90 degrees. I just think it gives the most pleasing image, but <clears throat> things change like that. So that's how you go about designing the uh, kaleidoscope that you want to make, is Get an idea of how big you want to make one. Like say you want to make a little pocket kaleidoscope and it's going to be say three inches long. Or your lens is going to have to be um, two thirds to three quarters of that length. So you have room to uh, engineer in the rest of it like objects and so forth. Telitoscopes are a different story and I've done very few of the telitoscopes. The telitoscope is the one where instead of these objects, you have another lens that is uh, very um, pronounced in its curvature, or often they have an acrylic or crystal glass ball that acts as a lens to the world around you, and then it breaks that image up through the mirrors into this lens where you view it. So uh, what we have here is depicted as an object chamber that slips over the outside barrel of the kaleidoscope and turns, thus the Teflon bearing that keeps the glass from rubbing against the mechanism. That's what that's all about. And then your object chamber has to be big enough to accommodate your objects and allow them to tumble around. And then there's another piece of glass on the other end that would allow um, light to come in. Now, I always used all glass optics on my um, rings and things like that is because they got such rough use and glass doesn't scratch as easily as plastic. Another thing to keep in mind with your objects is if you're using glass objects, you'll probably want to use a glass divider window between the mirrors and the objects because glass on glass doesn't tend to scratch each other. But if you have a plastic window, even if the glass is um, all rounded and smooth, it can scratch that plastic window after a while because glass is much harder than plastics, even polycarbonates. So I always went with glass on that. Uh, the problem you have with that is fragility and, and that sort of thing. And you can have a much thinner piece of plastic here, which is another part of the design and elements to consider because the more, uh, let's see, the more closely you can have your objects to the actual mirrors, the ends of the mirrors, the more symmetrical 
your image will be. If you've ever looked at a kaleidoscope and you notice that down in the center of the image, it kind of seems off-center, sort of oblong almost. Well, that's because of a, something I call parallax error. I don't know if that's correct, but it's because your eye is going to look down the edge of where the two mirrors meet, for instance, and it's going to be diverge from an angle of that. Um, so the longer they are, the more likely your image is going to be symmetrical, but you can't have them infinitely long. But you'll find a point when you experiment by just cutting up some mirror and slapping them together and seeing what they look like, um, you'll find a point where th that effect diminishes so much you don't really notice a difference between one or the other. And that's probably the, the point at which you'd want to cut your mirrors that length, if that's your goal. Um, but there's a lot of different compromises in building a kaleidoscope, and that's just one of many. I hope I, I've cleared up a few things, and I'm going to make some more videos that will address some of these other um, issues going on with kaleidoscope design, but it'll be probably a piece-by-piece -piece thing, like just the mirrors, just the lenses, um, maybe the objects, that sort of thing. Thank you.